So be sure uh, to say goodbye to the Criders uh, today before you leave. Um, but go ahead and uh, open up your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. It's page 511 if you're using one of the pew Bibles in front of you. <clears throat> there is an important moment in our lives, all of our lives. It's, it's pivotal to our growth and our maturity in the Lord. It's also one we tend to uh, avoid or fight. Something we don't really want to give into, but eventually we get there. It's that moment where you realize that your parents actually do know what they're talking about. We fight it, we avoid it, but there's a moment where it happens and we realize they actually do have some wisdom to share. So do you remember that moment for you? Can you remember when that happened? It's a lesson, it's a great lesson to learn, one we need to learn. But for some reason, and I'll speak for myself here, maybe you're in this boat, when I became a parent, I just thought my kids would sit at my feet and listen to my wisdom. <laughs> like we convince ourselves of this, and we know that that's not true, that's not how it works. It's a nice, fa- uh, nice thought, but it's very, very false. And then I was thinking, what if, what if we never had to give a warning to our children? Like, well, isn't parenting majority warning? Or again, is that just me? Like, you don't do that. You, you don't want to take this path. You don't want to go that way. You don't want to do this. Like, what if we never had to give a warning to a child? But we know that's not the case. We're constantly warning because we love them, right? Because we want to protect them. We want to care for them. We do it because they lack wisdom, right? That's why we do it. They lack wisdom. And I think many of us, could probably make the connection when we first realize our parents actually know what they're talking about and have wisdom to a time where we didn't listen to them, then we got into trouble, and we got the consequences of that, and all of a sudden we're like, man, they're actually right. They told me this was going to happen. So for me, uh, I broke up with Jackie twice um, in high school and going into college. And I was living at home while I was in college, um, so that for anybody who's living at home and you're in college, you still have to listen to your parents. I, um, my parents both said that when I wanted to date Jackie again, no, we're not going to let you. And I, I mean, I'm in college. I'm 18 years old. Like, who has the right to tell me that? Well, my parents do. And they had really, 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 really good reason for that, mainly because they were protecting Jackie. <laughs> from me and the foolishness of myself and our relationship. And, and so I'm thankful for that now. Did I like it then? No. Do we see the wisdom in it now? Yes. That's the reason why we tell students they shouldn't date in high school now, because we experience all the foolishness that goes into that kind of relationship. But unfortunately today, many of the foolish voices out there are much louder than the voices of wisdom. Okay? Much louder more persistent in our lives. And so we're looking at this passage. This is a warning passage in Proverbs 1, 8 through 19. We're going to take it in three sections. We're going to look at the first part as an encouragement. The second part then is the warning. And the last part is the lesson. And we're going to see that there are voices we should be listening to and voices we should not be listening to and the reasons for that. So let's look first at verses 8 through 9 of chapter 1. We're going to look at the encouragement Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. So when we come to this word listen in the Bible, or some translation says hear, it is really, really important we just don't skip over and just assume, oh, oh, he's just trying to get our attention. Yes, that's true, but there's so much more to this word. Many of you know the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. That's the most popular. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. It'll be on the screen uh, for us. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The Shema. This is still said today as really a pledge of allegiance and praise of who God is. And it's this word that means hear and do. Take this in, listen to it, but it's not just to file away as some good information. It's meant to get in, massage into our hearts, massage into our lives, these truths that we live them out. 
That's what it means. Don't just know intellectually that the Lord is God, that he is one, right? but actually love him then. Let that sink into your heart and live it out. And so when we get this word, the word Shema, we need to listen, meaning we need to take it in, we need to hear what it says, and we need to see how it applies to our life and what we're to do with it. Again, my experience is my kids and myself as a kid did not always think of that word in that way. I heard you. Right? How many times do we say that? I heard you. Did you really? When we see it in the Bible, are we really listening? Are we really paying attention? So that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to listen. Now, who are we supposed to listen to? Well, it's right there. Your father's instruction and your mother's teaching. So listen to the godly dad and the godly mom that the Lord hopefully has given you in your life or maybe others who serve in that role for you. But what we see here is the father and the mother are responsible for the social, for the moral, and the theological education of their children. That's the primary responsibility that they have with their kids, is to make sure that this is happening. It's more than helping with homework. It's more than getting your kids to share and getting along with others. It is everything about their life. You are primary in that for them. So when it comes to godly wisdom, to showing the way that a person is supposed to go, a child is supposed to go, it needs to start with a dad and a mom who are following God. It cannot be outsourced. Okay? It cannot be outsourced to others. Parent, uh, teachers are, are great. Mentors are great. Um, pastors are great. Right? Maybe? Okay. Um, you, you've got Sunday school teachers. You've got these coaches and music and all these different things that the kids, and that's great. And they need to have those people in their life. And hopefully they're hearing godly wisdom from many of them. But it, primarily it has to come from you. It cannot be outsourced to others. We need to have allies, but we cannot, because we can't be alone. But we also can't just say, ah, somebody else is going to do it. Somebody else is going to take care of it. That means that the home is the best and the safest place for children to learn to wise up. It is. It's the best and safest place for them. That's where they're going to spend the most time. That's where they're going to see wisdom modeled or not modeled. That's where they have God's word open on a daily basis, hopefully, or not. And and so this is where it's going to happen. This is where children can hear daily God's word. They can ask questions. They can see it modeled and they can continue to grow in wisdom. It's constant teaching and instruction from a godly mom and a godly dad. And then we get the reason, the motivation, the reward in verse 9. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. That's not the most exciting reward, right? (laughs) If I said, hey, guys, you're going to get a garland on your head. Or this this great necklace, you know, it's going to hang. It it doesn't seem good until you start to realize, well, what is the point of the garland? What is the point of the necklace? It's to make your physical appearance stand out so people take notice of you. Well, what happens when children listen to the teaching and instruction of their parents? Their character shows. Godly character comes through. That's what it is. This is the garland. This is the pendant. When people see you, they're like, man, there's something different about them. They're the ones that people say, wow, you've got great kids. Why? Because they see something different. They they see obedience. They see love. They see submission from the kids to their parents. And it's attractive. And we know this. Right? Because we've seen kids like that. We've seen kids on the other end. For them, it is a garland. It brings honor. And it brings life. And it brings beauty to those who listen. So there's three groups of people that, in this passage, really need to pay attention to what's happening here. The first one is obvious. It's parents. This is a call for us. Right? As parents, that we need to make sure that we are, we, we're wise. Like, we're walking with the Lord. We know what the, Lord, what the Word says, that we can actually instruct and teach what God's Word says to our kids. Is this teaching from the Lord, or is it worldly wisdom? And this is huge, because study after study is showing kids who walk away from the faith in college started to do it in high school and middle school. Why? Because they started to see that worldly wisdom was seeping into the home, worldly wisdom was seeping into the church, and they started to ask questions. And they didn't always have people there to ask those questions to. And then when they get to college, they feel bold enough to ask those questions, and they start asking them the wrong people. 
Not the godly moms and dads here, but the ones that we're going to get to in just a second. And that's who they're asking these questions to. And they start to walk away. Because it wasn't the world, it wasn't godly wisdom, it was the world's wisdom. And it wasn't because parents, that we, that we wanted to do this, that we meant to do this, it just started to seep in. And if we don't know this, we won't have the filter to say, ah, I don't think that's right. That's the world's wisdom. That's not God's wisdom. So we need to make sure that we are in this book and able to bring God's wisdom to our children. Because when our children walk out the door to hang out with friends, to go to school, to move to college, when they are online, they are going to be bombarded with worldly wisdom. Bombarded with it. Constantly coming at them every single day. We cannot leave them to figure it out for themselves. Because they need wisdom. They need God's wisdom. They need us to bring it to them. We are not, as parents, going to be judged for the path our children choose. We will be held accountable for what we do to prepare them when that fork in the road comes. Where are they going? Do they know not to go down this path? Because we've warned them. Because we've shown them. Because we've talked about delaying gratification. Because there's something so much better over here. That's what we're going to be held accountable to. Do we prepare them for that moment? Do we get them there? And that means knowing God's wisdom and sharing it with our kids. We don't want them to be swayed easily because we did not prepare them for that. The second group are really the rest of us. Mature Christians. People who are walking with the Lord who have wisdom to share. Maybe you have kids, maybe you don't, maybe you have grandkids, maybe you work in Kid City or with a youth group or whatever else, but you have kids in your life. We need to continue to surround them with godly wisdom, people who are willing to share tough truths that are true because they're from God's word, no matter what. Because parents need help. <laughs> parents need help. They're primary, but they need a lot of help. And they need us to be the ones to bring that wisdom to their kids when they're not there, right? to partner with them. And then you may know children in your life who don't have godly parents. And you may be the only one bringing godly wisdom to them. Take that role seriously too. That is huge. If you want to get involved with kids, if you want to make an impact, an impact in God's kingdom, start with kids. Ask me about discipling a student. Ask me about serving in Kid City or City Link or youth group. That's where true impact is going to happen. Because they need all that wisdom that you have. Ben Stewart, um, a few years back on discipleship, was, was giving a talk. And he says this about kids. He says, they have zeal. What they lack is wisdom. They have passion. What they need is someone to talk sense to them. And he says, and that's what you have. That's what we have. Like, if we have God's wisdom, if we are, if we are in this book, and we have life experience, and we keep it for ourselves, it's at the detriment of our kids the detriment of the next generation. And guess what? They're going to fight us on it because we fought our parents on it. Right? We fought others. When God's wisdom was brought to us, we said, ah, that doesn't sound right. I'd rather go with the worldly wisdom. And we keep going. We keep bringing it to them, trusting that if it's God's wisdom, it's going to break through eventually. And then finally, kids, teenagers, young adults, you're the last group that needs to listen to this. And you're probably expecting me to say what I'm going to say. Listen and obey your parents which is good because God's word tells us to do that. And that's all I should really need to say. But there is more to that. There is a motivation. It's the fact that when you're sitting there and you want to roll your eyes at your parents, right? Because that's the urge. When that happens, think about this. They're doing what God called them to do. Right? They're doing what God called them to do. They love you. Right? And they're just being obedient to what God has laid on their hearts for you. So when you just want to slam a door, when you want to roll your eyes, when you want to question them, step back for a second and say, I may not agree, but who are you not agreeing with? Your parents or God? Ask that question. Right? Because they love you and they're pursuing your heart, which means they're going to bring God's wisdom and it's not always going to be comfortable. They're not perfect, but they are trying and they're trying to follow the Lord. Okay, so we know we're supposed to listen and who we're supposed to listen to and why. Okay, but that means if there's voices we should listen to, there's voices we should not listen to. So let's look at the warning in verses 10 through 16. 
My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie in wait for innocent blood. Let's ambush some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Cast lots with us. We will all share the loot. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. For their feet rush into evil. They are swift to shed blood. Don't give in to sinful men. And you read that and you say, well, we're all sinful, right? Like we're, all, we're all sinners. If we're here, I think the majority of us would say, yes, I'm a sinner. So who is the father talking about here? Well, the word that's used for sinful here carries more of the weight of what people living like the last half of Proverbs 1.7. So if you look above, which we looked at last week, verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What's the second part? And, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The, the sinful here are those who live as if there's no God. They live as if there's no God. Sin has become chronic. It is a habit. It is something they don't want to change. They have no desire to change. So they are very comfortable in their sin. And they're coming to someone and saying, join us, right? Join us in our sin. That's the sinner that they're talking about. Another way you can think about it is if, if we break the law, any one of us, I mean, generally we're considered a criminal, right? We've committed a crime. We're, we, we've broken the law. There's a big difference between that and somebody we would call a hardened criminal, Right? Somebody whose just life is constant in and out of prison. Like they'd be just, this is just their life. This is what they do. It's chronic. Okay, so that's the difference right here. So, so the sinful people are those who have turned away from God. They're living as if there is no God. And now they're trying to bring somebody else in with them. So they entice them. And he's saying, don't give in. Don't give in to that negative peer pressure. And like probably most of us as parents, we have a story or a scenario or something we're going to give to our kids to try to teach them this lesson. And so that's what the father does here. And it's really simple. It's a, it's a very simple, straightforward example. And, and pretty extreme, which again helps us to learn uh, more about what this, is, what this actually entails. So it's about robbery and murder. All right? And so this gang of men come to another young man and say, come along with us and join us. We're going to ambush, murder, and steal from some innocent, unsuspecting person. For what reason? to gain stuff, to get possessions, to get valuables in our life. They are doing it for greed. And so we looked at this passage, I believe, in our generosity series, but we're going to look at it from a different angle. So this is a living parable of what we see in 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. This is what greed for gaining money can do to us. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You see, that's exactly what's happening here. So greedy, want so much stuff and, and this money and, and to plunder that they are willing to kill. And so they come and they say, join us. Now, what's more attractive than the plunder of this loot, or this loot that they want to get? What, what, what's more attractive might be the community that they're inviting this person into. So if you, if you know anything about the, like gang culture, actual gang culture, this is a huge thing. Community, right? To be a part of a community, to be a part of a family. Right? And so that's what's attractive here. Look, did you hear how many times it says us or we? in this passage, to, to, again, lure this person in. It says, come along with us. It says, we will get all sorts of valuable things. Cast lots with us. And then we will share all the loot. I mean, that plunder and community sounds a lot better than garland and a pendant. Like, you can get some people on your side with that. If those are my options, right? The plunder and the community, that sounds... Pretty attractive. And that's why the warning is here. The Father knows this. We know this. Sin is attractive. It's really attractive. We want it. We want to go after it. The enticement is real. And so the Father knows this. And that's what this warning is about. This is going to look really good. It's going to sound really good. Don't do it. 
right? Don't do it. Things cannot deliver ultimately. These false promises that you are hearing. So if we step back and we think about it, when people are a means to my own end, okay, in this situation, what happens then if in this group I join this group and we murder and we steal and we get a lot of money? What happens in that group when I become the person who has the most? I become the innocent victim eventually, right? That's probably what's going to happen. And it happens a lot because we have this thing inside of us where we don't like the success of somebody else. And so all of a sudden, I start to get the target on my back. And so they start to bring somebody, hey, hey, come along with us. We know this victim. We know where he's going to be. We're going to take his stuff. And that's an extreme example. But just think in your own life, how many times has that happened where you felt betrayed by someone else, by a group of friends that you thought were friends? Because they're foolish. And now I become an obstacle and the community turns on me. Now, Proverbs, uh, we're not obviously in the whole book of Proverbs. We're just in chapters 1 and 2 here. But we know throughout the book of Proverbs that it talks a lot about these two paths. The path of the righteous, those who follow the Lord, and the path of the unrighteous, the, the wicked, those who despise God. And the Father says, don't go that way. Don't go the path of the wicked. Because what's the outcome? Evil. And bloodshed in this example. Now, most of us aren't fearful of kids in this church or kids in our family or many of the kids that we know being drawn into a life of murder and robbery. Okay? It's not the thing that I think about or worry about with my kids. However, the pattern here, our kids will see all the time. The pattern of drawing someone in. Of that peer pressure, that's exactly what's happening here, is just peer pressure to bring somebody in. So they're going to see this a lot. And we want to prepare them for what happens in that moment when those things look really, really attractive. And the things my parents are saying over here, the things the church are saying over here, don't really seem that great. Or I have to wait a really long time to get those. But this is here. It's instant. We need to prepare them for those situations. We need to help them wise up by warning them and warning them uh, with actual examples of situations. That means if you've had examples in your life, you need to share them. Age appropriate, but you need to share them. Right? Let them see that you have failed. Let them see how you have learned, and now you are wiser for it. Don't pretend like we've always been wise. That's another temptation, right? We are not, and we are continuing to grow in wisdom as well. And we, as those who are older, need to take this fatherly advice as well. It may not be physical blood, uh, physical blood or material possessions, but there are things in life we are tempted to pursue and others are getting in our way. Okay? And so we need to be careful as well. Ray Ortland says this, There are many legal, polite, arguable, even religious ways of saying, come with us. Let us lie and wait for blood. You hear that? There are many legal, polite, arguable, even religious ways of saying, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. It's coming from pride and envy and greed and retaliation and all these things that we know will, can sometimes get into our heart and we let sit there long enough will cause us to react, will cause us to do something. So maybe it's using another person or a relationship to get something you want. Maybe it's ruining the reputation of another person through gossip and slander. Maybe it's wanting bad things to happen to people so you can be right. Or you can justify yourself in something. Or you can say, gotcha. It could be scrolling your news feed with the purpose of, and I, I use those words deliberately, scrolling through your news feed deliberately to pounce on someone else who has a different view of something than you to be out there for blood, to be out there to make somebody else look bad, to make yourself look better. We can all be tempted to follow the come along with us. It's the tribalism that Brandon mentioned last week. Right? This tribalism that, that I'm going to get my tribe and every other tribe is against us. And other, every other tribe is my enemy. And so we throw insults from one side to the other and nothing ever gets done. The problem is usually 
the tribalism ends up being whittled down until there's just a tribe of one, of you. Because there's nobody in the world that has the exact same opinion or view on everything there is like you do. So eventually you're going to whittle it down and just be like, I'm very comfortable here. I'm my own little island, my own little tribe, because I don't fight with myself. Right? But eventually that gets really, really lonely. And so then what tribe are you going to go to next? Who is going to say, come along with us? And where are you going to go? Come along with us. It's something we are all tempted to do. You guys heard that too? Okay. (laughs) So don't go with them, right? The father says don't go with them because they rush into evil and their feet are swift to shed blood. So in other words, what he's saying is don't follow them because they don't think. They don't sit there and weigh the consequences of their actions. They just do. They just do. So we need to think about it. So this is the warning that the father gives. All right? So now we come to this lesson. So we know the people we're supposed to listen to, what we're supposed to listen to. We know who we're not supposed to listen to and why. So what is the lesson that we get in all this? Let's finish up with uh, verses 17 through 19. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. So my boys like to chase squirrels and birds, right? Because they think they can catch them. Um, And so this happens all the time. And I just let them do it because I don't actually fear for the life of the animal. Um, I think the animal is just going to be fine. But so they like to chase and and go after them. And, uh, you know, when you think about what the father's doing here and saying, like, it's like setting a trap for a bird. I mean, as soon as my boys approach a bird, they're out of there. Right? So it's useless to kind of come with a trap up to a, uh, up to a bird and try and trap it. As soon as it sees you, it's going to go. Right? And so what he's saying here in, in this moment is that's what a fool does. Well, actually, the bird's smarter than the fool because the fool actually goes and sets the trap and gets caught in it himself. He, he ambushes himself. So I don't know if you're Looney Tunes fans, but Wile E. Coyote, the poor guy, right? The poor guy always trying to catch Roadrunner. And what always happens he gets caught in the trap that he set for the roadrunner. Whether that means he's cutting a circle around and falls through, right? Or, or it's mouse traps and then they all end up on him somehow. What, whatever it is, Wiley Coyote cannot do it. It's the same thing. This is what fools do. I'm going to set this trap only to get caught in it myself. That's what happens. It's just a matter of time before those who ambush others will ambush themselves and they learn the lesson the hard way. The principle here sounds, in in verse 19, sounds a lot like Matthew 16. When Jesus says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Fine, get everything you want. Everything you desire. You're going to lose it all. And you're also going to lose the most important thing. Your life. Your soul. I mean, that's what it's saying here. This This is the plea, the warning, and the love of a father. Don't do it. You're going to give up your very life. Those who do this set ambush, they ambush themselves. So if you step on others, if you try to make your own way, despise God's wisdom, if you do all that, no matter what gains you have in this life, and you may have many, you may know these people. They step on others all the time, and they're doing really, really well in that. Like people envy them. People want to be them. People pay them to to come to conferences and say, how do you have all this success? And if they're, they're honest, it's, it's because I use other people. But, but this happens, and, and we wonder, what's going on? Is this, is this proverb true? We're going we're to come to that question in a second. But what this is saying is, whether it's ill-gotten gain or whether it's just pursuing the world's stuff and earthly gain here, it's all lost at the end. The only thing remaining is my soul and yours. That's it. So are we willing to give that up for some temporary pleasure? Something that we think is going to satisfy us for having success and status for a little while. Getting that new thing for a little while. Are we going to give up our soul for something like that? 
What this father is saying is, it's not worth it. Remember all that, that plunder in that community over here, the garland and the pendant over here? Choose this. Choose this because this is sure. And this is going to last. And, and this is going to go away. In fact, all of this replaces this in a better way. Like the church community and the community in heaven, heaven is going to be a whole lot better than the community over here of fools. The plunder and all these riches and these valuable things you're going to get, you have reward in heaven. A glorious inheritance. The riches of God's grace that will never end. But I can see these things. I can't always see these. Right? This is why we trust. This is why we listen to wisdom and wise people. So as you read through this, and I just mentioned it, as we read through this, there is a question. I asked this question myself reading through it. Is this true? Okay? Do things actually end up this way? Right? Especially in verse 19. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Is that true? So maybe you're sitting there, you're like, I've, I've followed the right path. Right? You haven't g- given in to the come along with us. You, you make sure you stay away from that. And yet things just keep going poorly for you. You've lo- lost relationships. You've lost a job. You've missed opportunities. You have no idea where your life is going. And then you look across the aisle. And these people who step on others, who use others, who despise God, seem to be doing all right. right? They're, they're doing pretty good. So is this true? Do we see this happening? Because there are people right now who are greedy, who are doing all the wrong things, and may never get caught in this life for their greed, for their ill-gotten gain. They may never get caught. And that's just reality. They may never experience justice here. They may continue to steamroll others until they gain and gain and gain more for themselves. But what this passage is, what this passage is saying, is it's pointing to something beyond this life. They will ambush themselves. They will. That is, that is what's going to happen. And the trap may not catch them now, but it will in the end because God's judgment is real. It is coming and it is final for all those who choose to ignore, who choose to despise, who choose to say there is no God and live as if the world is all there is. You will forfeit your soul. You will. If you continue to pursue a life of ill-gotten gain and you will have no one to blame but yourself. That's what happens in the end. This story played out in the life of Jesus with Judas, didn't it? Here's Judas going to the religious leaders. Come along with us. Join our plan. We want to take Jesus down. And so what does he do? He, he, he sells. He betrays Jesus for silver. He says, I'll join. Right? I'll turn my back on him. What did they do? Well, they went to the garden. They ambushed Jesus. They took Jesus. And they killed Jesus, the innocent man. That's what they did in that moment. The gang shows up. Take the innocent man to his death. And we think, is this proverb true? What's going to happen? And it, it appears that Judas and religious leaders have proven this false. Until... As Daniel Aiken reminds us, it says, Judas threw in his lot with the gang to ambush an innocent man for profit, and it looked like he won. But by Sunday morning, G- Judas was in the grave, and Jesus stands up and walks out of his. Like, that's the promise. That's the truth that will happen. So is this passage true? Yes. Because it's looking beyond just this life. Right? It's looking beyond just this life. All of us are sinful. All of us have used other people for our own gain at some point in our lives. Whether we sit there and we think of examples or not, we have used someone in our life to get something. Whether material possessions maybe, whether it was for relationship, feeling good about ourselves, on and on I could go with probably the twisted ways that we've used people 
in our lives. And this kind of life will lead to judgment and eternal punishment apart from Christ. So this is why we need Jesus. This is why, because this is all of us. Jesus is the only one who never gave in to the lure of a gang. Never did. Never. And when he was tempted, when he was hungry and tired by Satan in the wilderness, to to go after ill-gotten gain, to get some food, right? To be given the kingdoms. He stood up and he said, no. Why? Because he had the wisdom of God's word. And he knew that this was better. Following this was better than anything Satan could promise him. So he wouldn't give in. Proverbs 1 is clear. We are to reject the enticement of the wicked. Because everything the wicked promises promises us pales in comparison to the promises of God in Jesus Christ. I already mentioned them. We have the righteousness of Christ. We have the riches of his grace. Read Ephesians 1. See everything in there that we have in Christ. And these are the promises of God to us that we have in Jesus. And we get to see him face to face. Jesus has everything to do with this passage because not only does he save us from our sinful and wicked ways, he gives us what we need to say no to the temptations of the world. So listen to Titus 2, verse 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. I mean, that is just a passage, that, a glorious passage that's packed with so much truth. And what Proverbs 1 and Titus 2 are giving us is that the truth, this truth that we need to hold on to, that will get us to the end, okay? That will get us to the beyond what we just see. Judas couldn't see the end, the ultimate end. And all he saw was his purposes here, right? And he made his decision. He made his decision. It was right in front of him. I'm going to take the money, right? He couldn't see the end, so he makes his decision, and it cost him his life. Jesus could see the end. Jesus saw beyond the end. And he endured the cross and the shame and death on a cross because he knew what was coming. Because he had godly wisdom. And he knew it was going to bring glory to his Father. And it was good for you and for me. Christopher Ash points out that many of us think the whole point of discipleship is to, to force us to look up. To look up to God. And he says, yes, that's right and true. But he says the Christian life is also looking forward. Right? The Christian life is looking up and it's looking forward. It's looking beyond. Because the only reason we can be in a situation where we're tempted and enticed to follow the world, the only way we can stand up to that is because we look forward. Because we see beyond. There's no other reason to. If this world and this life is all there is, then do all of that. But he's saying, in Jesus, we look forward, we look ahead, we look beyond what we can see to something better because it's what's beyond us. It's going to change the way we view things. It's going to change our morality. And it's going to help us wise up to make better decisions, to make more godly decisions in life as we pursue Jesus together. And that's what this warning is all about. Reject the world. Reject what's going to come because of the world, because of the, the despising of God, because of the rejection of him that will end. Or we can choose Jesus. We can follow him. We can pursue him together. And we will have glories that we will experience now. But, oh boy, wait till we get to the end and all that is to come. And that will help us to wise up in the decisions we have each and every day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for creating things the way that you did, knowing the way that things work and should work, and giving us your word to help us to follow after you. And Lord, when we're tempted, 
to despise you, to reject you, when we're tempted to look at others as a means to an end. Lord, help us to hear from you. Help us to know that there is something so much greater for us. Not only in that moment. When we get to eternity and we see you face to face. And all those decisions where we choose you will make more sense to us. We'll see how right you were and how good you are. And Lord, if there's anybody here who continues to listen to those voices to come along with us, Lord, change their heart. Help them to turn to you. Jesus, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen.